Father, we praise you because of Jesus. Because he is the one who has rescued us from darkness and death. He is the one who has uh, paid the price for our sins, adopted us as sons and daughters of the living God. He is the one who has saved us and changed us and made us whole. And tonight we simply praise his name and yield our lives to Jesus. And Father, you know our, our hearts, you know the darkness that lives in them, that right now we simply invite you to drive out, that, that nothing can stand before you and your spirit, and so we simply ask that you would fill us so that we can hear your word, so that it will take root in our souls and change us, and we can live as children of light and not children of darkness. So we give ourselves to you, in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps. Never sat on that side before. And, uh, <laughs> and turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Romans chapter 13. Romans 13 is our text tonight. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 1,127 and you will find Romans chapter 13. And, and as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible with you, then uh, take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God. We want you to read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, I just got to echo the uh, announcements that Mitch shared, the good news. Uh, over 300 volunteers, 11 schools, a whole bunch of projects done, paint on people. It's good stuff. And I just want to say thank you, uh, Calvary. Way to go. And I know you guys already clapped and celebrated and all that kind of stuff. But I just thank God that I get to be a part of a church that has that kind of vision for the community and has servants that will give their time, talents, energy, and effort to make that happen. So uh, praise God for that. And, and, uh, and, and if you're here, and I just got to say this too, and you've become a follower of Jesus Christ and you have not yet gotten <laughs> baptized, uh, Wednesday is your chance. Wednesday is your opportunity when people are gathering for that life group picnic just to celebrate and to demonstrate to the world that Christ has changed your life and that you're a follower of Jesus. Uh, you know, if he's driven the darkness out of your life, then stand up and tell the whole world he's done it. And, and call the church office, let them know you want to be on that list for Wednesday in the lake. And don't pull that hole. It's too cold. <laughs> We've been praying for it to be cooler, and now it is. So get in the water, man up, woman up, and, and uh, suffer like this much for Jesus? What do you think? That much? You can do it? I think you can do it. So just saying. <laughs> Some of you are clapping. Are you volunteering? <laughs> is, that, is that what you want to put your name on the list? Hey, uh, today is joyfully bittersweet. Uh, and, uh, and it is such because it is Pastor O.C.'s final weekend here at Calvary on staff uh, as one of our pastors, because this next week, I think on Tuesday, he starts uh, his tenure as the senior pastor of First Southern Baptist Church, Scottsdale, Arizona. And uh, yeah. You know, some of them are excited uh, for right. you, and some of them are excited that you're leaving. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Uh, just it's one of those things. We don't know. Thank we, you, everyone, for we, that. I appreciate that. We can't really judge their hearts, uh, but, uh, but, you know, hey, it, it's that way, you know. Yeah. All of our, get, our guests at our house bring us happiness, mm -hmm. some by coming, some by leaving. Some by leaving, it's, uh, exactly. it's all good. So anyway, nine years Chad has <laughs> been here on staff at Calvary, uh, and, and a lot has changed. I mean, the church has grown. Uh, uh, we, you know, things are different. We've built, we've relocated, we've done all this kind of stuff, getting ready to add new services. And, and I'll just tell you, if you weren't here nine years ago, Chad has changed uh, in a lot of ways. Well, he's not any taller, but he is older and wiser. I had hair when I moved here. That's... I did. Not, not much. Not much. Okay. <laughs> not much. Don't let, him, don't let him kid you. So he's been student pastor, he's been family pastor, he's been teaching pastor, and today he and I are sharing this message uh, because it just seemed right, and this passage seems appropriate uh, for the occasion. So, Chad, would you uh, uh, share the passage with us? So read with me in uh, Romans chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 8. It says, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the, love, for the one who loves another is fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. 
Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly in this daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Mm. So the command is simply this. The command is to love. To love. Uh, now, this is a recurring theme at Calvary. If you've been coming at any length of time at all, you know we talk about loving uh, God. We talk about loving our neighbor. And we, and we share that because it's a recurring theme in Scripture. You know, the great commandment, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. We know that Jesus said in John chapter 13, a new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So you shall love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And, and so uh, we know the command is to love. So Chad, let me just ask you uh, this question. How have you personally experienced uh, that whole command to love your neighbor in your life and your tenure here at Calvary? So there have been many ways. I, I mean... Several years ago, my dad passed away, and the outpouring of love and support in that time was monumental. There have been uh, gifts. There have been, there's been generosity. There's been uh, Christmas time. There's been so much food. It's <laughs> been amazing. But the thing, the moment that pops out the most to me uh, in uh, the love that I've received uh, while here at Calvary uh, was right after we got here. We moved here. Uh, Jana, uh, my wife, was pregnant. We had just found out we were pregnant with our first uh, child. And, and the beginning weeks of that pregnancy went really well. We, we moved here. We got settled in. Uh, and everything was going fine. And uh, about May, uh, we went in for Jana's 29-week uh, checkup. And she was in preterm labor. Uh, and they put her on a helicopter. And they flew her to Phoenix. And in that moment, my life changed dramatically. Because I went from being pastor at Calvary, and that was my big priority, and, 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 you know, all of that, too. I didn't care about anything but taking care of my wife in that moment, and the cool thing was is that in that moment, the staff at Calvary said, we feel the same way. Your job is safe here. You go and be with your wife. We'll take care of your ministry, and there were pastors that stepped up and led the youth ministry while I was gone, um, people stepped up and gave us gift cards so that we could eat while we were away from our home. Uh, I had people that offered to pay for my gas because I was driving back and forth between Phoenix and Havasu uh, once or twice a week. And people were saying, hey, you, when you come back into town, uh, meet me at this gas station. I'll fill up your tank. I mean, the, mm. the pouring of love in that moment when I needed it most was phenomenal. It was amazing to feel I had only been here five months and people were just giving and being generous and sending me messages saying, hey, we're, we're thinking and praying about you and offering help. And it was truly one of those moments in my life where I, I don't know that I've ever felt loved in that particular way by a group of people. And so uh, Calvary's a church that loves. Uh, and that's one thing I love about this church. It's, that's why Calvary exists. It's to lead people to that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through what? Through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And so for me, the impact, as someone who has felt the impact of love from Calvary, don't ever let that go. Hmm. Calvary is known as the church that gives back, that loves people. So I would encourage you, if you see someone that is in need, if you feel God calling you to act in someone's life, as someone who has received that, don't ignore that call from God. Mm -hmm. uh, when God says, hey, there's someone in front of you that, that needs help, uh, needs some of your time, needs some of your resources, give. Continue to give generously the way you've always given generously. I mean, that's why we have benevolence here at Calvary. Every time that we do communion here, uh, we take up what's called a benevolence offering. And that offering, every, mu every penny that goes in those plates, when we take that special, different offering here at Calvary, it goes to help the community. 
It goes to help the needy here in Lake Havasu. And I've gotten to experience being one of the people to help give uh, out of that benevolence fund and see how it changes lives. So continue to be a church of generosity. Continue to be individuals of generosity. So we want to owe nothing but love. Uh, I, I just have to rant for a minute because this passage is often misused. And, and a lot of people take it and apply it to basically saying, hey, uh, it's about money and you can't borrow money. And, and, uh, and while there is a, a lot in Scripture about uh, not taking on foolish debt and, and not being a debtor and those kinds of things, this passage is not really uh, one of them. Uh, in fact, if you, if, since we're real big on context, and if you read the whole thing, look at the verse right before it, verse 7. I love this. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves has fulfilled, fulfilled the law. So we're to owe love. That's what God is calling us because that fulfills the law. Now, uh, notice that not only do we not want to owe things we don't uh, want to owe like to people because we want to pay the respect and pay the taxes and stuff like that, we also don't want to owe people apologies. We don't want to owe people favors. Uh, and understand, we owe the debt of love because God loved us first. That, I mean, that's what it all boils down to is we're loving others because God loved us first. 1 John 4.10 says this is love. Not that you and I loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So the, the love that Calvary had to pour out on Chad and Jana in those early days uh, is because Christ loved us first. The love that you guys demonstrated to the community of Lake Havasu and our schools today is because Jesus loved us first. So we owe that debt of love, and uh, we want to pay it because Christ paid our debt on the cross. Now, uh, Chad, you're uprooting your family to go to Scottsdale because you love God. And, and not everybody necessarily understands that. that you're his servant, and as a servant of Christ, uh, he owns your life. Yeah. And, and all of us uh, who claim to be followers of Christ are servants of Christ, and he owns our lives, and, and he can you know, move us where he wants to, so he's moving you to a new place, a new location. Um, and, and I'll just uh, uh, address this, because a lot of people have asked me, you know, since uh, you told them you were going, uh, are you going to replace OC? You can't replace me. That was my line. <laughs> I'm I was a unicorn, say, baby. I'm unique. You know, I don't know about the unicorn. <laughs> Every unicorn I've ever seen has hair. So, oh, uh, low but, uh, blow, man. Low no, blow. no, no. He's, you know, uh, <laughs> Chad's irreplaceable because he's a friend. Uh, he's been part of our team for uh, going on nine years. Uh, we love him, so we're not going to replace him, but uh, let me just explain. We're going to replace everything he does, <laughs> okay, because we have to. Now, some of that's going to be because people like you, volunteers who have gifts, are going to step up and to leadership. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of it's going to be given to other staff members uh, because they want his job anyway. And, uh, <laughs> and we've been interviewing people. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but we're planning to launch two new campuses in January. You know, one in Parker, one over at McCulloch at our, at our, our previous sanctuary. And, and so we've been interviewing worship leaders and tech directors and pastors for months trying to add to our team because we need more help. And, and he's walking out the door when we're trying to expand. So, yes, we're, you're going to see. Look, <laughs> did, I, did I mention that he's God's servant and God can do with him what he wants? So, I, you know, there's, there's no bitterness here. We, we give him each other a hard time uh, for that. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, but hey, we're not going to replace Chad, but we are going to add people to the team at Calvary. So you're going to see new faces and, and just expect that because uh, if we're going to grow and we're going to reach people who don't know Jesus in Parker and we're going to uh, keep reaching them in Havasu, we're going to add people to the team. But uh, no way, shape, or form are we going to replace uh, this guy sitting over here. I'm not sure that anybody we've talked to has a beard like that. Amen. So, uh, Amen. Preach it. Now... Since you're uh, talking about that, uh, let me also address some of the questions that I've gotten. Uh, a lot of you have come and asked, so were you looking, like, are you not happy here at Calvary? Were you, did your, was your resume out there, and were you actively pursuing churches? No. Let me, let me just say right now that that was not what is happening. It's not how that, this uh, entire thing played out. My heart is, was, will be here at Calvary. 
I have a, I have a special place in my heart for this church. Um, but let me just kind of tell you how this played out. Um, about 10 months ago, um, one of their church uh, leaders actually called Chad and asked permission to request my resume. Did I tell you they, they wanted me to come to Scottsdale first? <laughs> hey, are you interested? No, I'm no. not. <laughs> no. But I've got a guy who's dumb enough to go. No, <laughs> no but they, they requested uh, my resume. Chad and I sat and talked. My wife and I prayed about it. Um, and the decision was made, if God's opening this door, maybe we should see where God's taking this. Um, and after a long process, we included uh, the leadership team of Calvary in on that. We've been praying about this and, and uh, seeking God's will on this for a very long time. But uh, I had to actually go look for my resume because I had no idea where it was at because uh, I had no desire to leave Calvary or go pursue another church. This has very much been one of those uh, God-ordained, God-directed, God-initiated uh, circumstances uh, for for all of us. So, so you're God's servant. He's moving you to a new place. Um, what has God taught you during your time here at Calvary that you hope to implement at First Southern Baptist Church Scottsdale? So, I think there are two things that I've learned here at Calvary that kind of sum up what I want to take from Calvary and take over there uh, to First Southern uh, Scottsdale. The first is that I love that everything here at Calvary revolves around the mission. And, and I've already stated it. Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. I've been able to say that in my sleep since probably a month and a half to two months after I moved here because everything is dictated by that statement. Uh, when we evaluate ministry and we look at mission projects and, and we look at what we're doing in the community and out in the world, everything goes back, does this lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus? And is it doing it through loving people and through the truth of God's word? Everything that Calvary does goes through that statement. And I love that because it, it so clearly defines what Calvary is. And it's biblical. It's so close. It's so in line with what God's word has to say. So that's the first thing that I think Calvary really has, has impacted me, and I want to take that and uh, implement that at uh, First Southern in Scottsdale. But the second one is that I've learned that love has to direct everything in my ministry and how we act as a church and an individual, uh, because love ultimately uh, shows us how to handle conflict. Uh, love shows us how to deal with uh, relationships and interact with people, and uh, without love, None of that is going to work. Um, if I try to handle a conflict, uh, 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 some kind of disagreement or uh, unhappiness or disgruntledness, and I don't do that with love, it's going to blow up in my face. Um, and so handling things with love um, really is something that I, I want to teach and, and show people uh, when I go to First Southern. But in saying that, I, I want to challenge you in that because... I've said two things, that the mission directs everything and that everything goes back to love. But think about your life personally. Is your life driven by a mission, a mission that God has given you? It, when you make decisions for your life, does it go back to, is this going to accomplish that the mission ha that God has, the mission that God has for me personally? Do you ask yourself those kinds of questions? Because I've learned being here at Calvary, that that mission doesn't just apply to the church. That mission applies to my life. Uh, and so when we, when Jana and I make decisions about raising our kids at school or where they go on this trip or do that or this, it always goes back to, is this going to achieve or enhance the mission that God has for us and our family? Um, and the second thing is part of that mission do you handle your relationships with love? When you deal with something in, in the relationships that you, you live life in day in and day out, do you ask yourself, am I showing this person love? Uh, is the way I'm handling this situation going to show them the love that I have for them and the love that Christ has for them? So I would challenge you to think through that as you live your lives day in and day out. 
Good words. Uh, the second half of this passage, just glance at this again, verses 11 through 14. Uh, Paul says, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Uh, So we talked about the command being to love. The challenge is this. The challenge is integrity. Integrity. We are to be people who represent Christ well. So if you're here tonight and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and that he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ with your life, then you can't really represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. And it really is about how we live in the community, how we live uh, um, in our families and in our jobs and uh, among the, the, the friends and neighbors that we have, especially how we act when our kids or grandkids are playing soccer or baseball or, or sports and stuff like that. Uh, it, it really is about the character because people are looking at us and judging Jesus. And, and one of the things I most appreciate about Chad Uh, is his character. Uh, The fact that he is a godly man. The fact that that he is a godly husband and father. That he is faithful and trustworthy. And before you guys want to nominate him for sainthood, I also have seen him fail and get angry and drop the ball. But here's here's what I know. And in fact, when, when I talked to the people in Scottsdale, the very first thing I said is he's a man of integrity. You can trust him. Uh, uh, you know, God is growing him uh, in that way. So, so Chad, um, let me just ask you this. How's God really shaped and developed your character uh, in these years here at Calvary? What, what has he taught you about yourself as a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, if any of you have ever spent any time around this guy right here, you know that he's constantly challenging you. Um, I don't know if you ever take time off. Like, do you ever, like, not work and challenge people. Oh yeah, oh, there's, yeah. A, there's a golf course uh, <laughs> nearby that I'm, I'm playing but that. One of the things that, I, I think of two things character-wise that Christ has taught me immensely over the years here at Calvary. The first one being is when I moved here, I didn't even realize it, but I had some serious uh, anger issues. Um, and uh, over the years, uh, Chad and Chet and Jesse and, and the, the staff here at Calvary have been instrumental in helping us see those issues that I had buried deep down inside and learning how to recognize them and how to deal with them in a godly way uh, rather than just letting them go, oh, it's just who I am and people are just going to have to deal with it. Um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that um, I struggled with for a very long time. And if it wasn't for my time here at Calvary and being surrounded by godly men and women here uh, at this church, I would have never made it through and claimed to be able to have victory in Christ um, if it wasn't for the instrumental part that everyone played here. Um, So that's the first one, is uh, learning to deal with those anger issues that I had. The second one is is that I've learned I don't know everything. Um, Yeah, you laugh, you laugh, but I moved here when I was like in my early 30s. and I thought I knew everything. I was fresh out of seminary. Um, I had just gotten the best biblical education you could get. Um, so I knew the Bible in and out. I thought I knew everything. I had the answer, and I was right about everything. I still am, but I'm a little more humble today. Um, <laughs> but in reality, I've learned that I'm not always right, and that my opinion is just that it's an opinion. And just because I have an opinion about a topic or whatever it may be does not mean that my opinion is black and white, the only right answer for that situation or that uh, area that I have an opinion on. Um, And so I've learned that rather than forcing and being right and making sure that my opinion is the one that's pushed, I've learned that people have to come first. Uh, That my opinions, if I am hurting people, 
by pushing my opinions, I'm losing. That's not what Christ calls me to do. Uh, I've never seen a Bible verse that says, drive your opinion and drive through people in that opinion. That, that's not what the Bible says. And, and so for me, one of the big ones has been growing and learning that I've got some great ideas, I've got some dumb ideas. Um, even if I think those ideas are right, they may not be. Uh, but let me be totally frank with you right now. Where are you on that spectrum? Uh, because I'll be honest, um, I'm friends with many of you on social media, <laughs> and I don't know that you've gotten this yet. Um, I don't know that you've gotten that you're not right, or that your opinion is not the only right opinion. Mm. Uh, I'm going to be totally honest. Many of us on social media and in day-to-day -day conversations at the diner, we're hurting people and we're pushing them away from Jesus because we think our opinions are more important than they are. And when you put your opinions or your political preferences in front of somebody and leading them to Christ, you've lost that battle. Mm -hmm. You've lost for Christ. And so your opinions are great. Have opinions. Research those opinions. Be educated on what's going on in the world but don't drive people away from Christ because your opinion is so important to you. Make sure that you put people first and leading them to Christ is your number one priority. Amen, amen. Well, Chad, uh, I, I just gotta, yeah, you guys can clap. You're, why, why should the musicians always get all the applause right? anyway, really? Right? You know, just wondering. <laughs> hey, you know, um, uh, I, I just got to say, it, it has been a, a joy to serve alongside of you for these past nine years. It's been a joy to watch you grow in Christ. Uh, it, it's been a joy to uh, see you develop as a leader, as a servant, as a preacher and teacher. Uh, and, uh, and you have been a blessing in so many ways. It's been a joy to see your family grow. And, and as you guys exercise faith in what it looks like to be a, a godly family, uh, struggling through some of the issues that you had, uh, you know, and to see God bless through that. Uh, it's just been uh, just a, a great journey to be on. And, and the great thing is uh, our journeys take us to exactly the same place, to the foot of the cross and heaven as our destination. Amen. And so for that, we are, uh, we are fellow servants and nothing changes that because the same Savior has paid for our sins. And, and so uh, I just simply want to say thank you for being a man of God. Thank you for loving your wife well, at least while you're here, so don't blow that. Uh, thank you for, well, hey, that's, hey, that's true for all of us. Amen. If you've been loving them well, then don't blow it. And if you haven't been, then repent. And, uh, uh, and, and thanks for, for being a blessing to Calvary, starting with our students and extending to our families and our team. Uh, it has been a, a great journey. We expect to see great things from you because we know your heart. We know your commitment. And we know that your skills. So uh, we just want you to know as a family of faith here at Calvary that we love you. And we're going to be praying for you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And let me, uh, let me return that a little bit. Um, <laughs> some of you will miss me. I do want to say this. Um, I've said many times, the nine years uh, that I've had here at Calvary have been life-changing. And there is no way on God's green earth that I would have ever even been considered for the job that I'm about to take on if it wasn't for the leadership development and the growth that I've experienced here at Calvary. So I want to thank all of you, um, not just the staff, not just uh, the leadership, but every single one of you. Thank you for your kindness and your generosity. Uh, for challenging me over the years. Um, I want to thank you for supporting my family. Um, my wife has never struggled to be a godly pastor's wife because uh, while we've been here at Calvary, because your support has been amazing. My son is uh, eight years old, and he has been uh, raised in a godly, amazing church, and I thank you so much for that. Um, you know, Chad mentioned it, over the last nine years, when I came here, Calvary was running just over 800 people, and right now, we run just right around 2,000, and there's a reason for that. It's not because of the amazing staff here, although that's a, an element, it's because Calvary makes a difference in this community. Calvary lives 
the mission of Christ in Lake Havasu. I mean, we were talking about earlier what happened this morning with Serve Our Schools. Don't ever give up the way that you are the hands and feet of Christ in this community. Because if Calvary disappeared from Lake Havasu City, Lake Havasu would mourn its loss. Um, and this has been an example to me. Uh, it has been an example of what a church should look like and how a church should go and make a difference. Um, so thank you very much. Um, love relentlessly. Um, serve tirelessly and live generously. Don't give any of those elements up because that's what makes Calvary such an amazing church and such a difference maker in this community. So thank you so much. Mm. Hey, we're going to, yeah. I'm going to invite Chad just to kind of stand up here at the front. And, and uh, while uh, the stage and the circumstances don't allow for everyone to come and lay hands on him, on, on behalf of the church, uh, I and some of our team are going to lay hands on him. We're going to invite all of you to uh, just join with us in praying for him, for the ministry, for First Southern Baptist Church Scottsdale, and for God to use him in an amazing way as he goes out from us, but he's always of us because he's part of our team, part of our family. Would you join with me in praying for Chad and Jana and Knox and Declan?